Welcome back. So in this video, we're going to talk about macro level causes of civil conflict or explaining why some countries experience civil conflict and others don't. Before we get there, I thought that I would provide a brief overview of the sorts of research that is done about civil conflict. We're obviously going to talk only about the start of conflict. We're not going to talk about the end of it or the processes that influence how conflict spreads or functions. So you might think of these questions in roughly chronological order. The first sets of questions ask about the causes, and these are the lectures that we're going to go through for this week. Today's lecture, of course, Macro Causes of War, looks at countries as the unit of analysis. Why are some countries more likely to experience civil war? Then there's a mezzanine level of conflict cause literature about community mobilization. Where does resistance to a government or an armed group arise? Why do some communities rebel, some communities become involved in conflict and others don't? And these then, of course, are communities within a country. Then lastly, we look at the individual level, individual recruitment. Why are some individuals persuaded to fight while others stay out? So obviously these questions are related because they all consider the onset of the conflict. And they're also related because they are additive. Obviously, states without communities willing to fight won't see a conflict. And communities without people willing to fight won't join the conflict. So we will see that there are some echoes of the theoretical assumptions made in the macro down to individual level conflict questions. The second set of questions considers what happens during a war. These questions diverge a little bit. Um, one issue we might consider is about the abuse of civilians. Why do some combatant groups commit violence against civilian groups and others don't? How do those combatant groups that do commit violence against civilians choose the civilian communities that they're going to abuse? We might also ask questions about combatant strategy. Why do some combatant groups choose strategies of confrontation with their enemies? Uh, how do, do they choose the sorts of um, territory they will conquer, the governance strategies they use, the weapons, all of these sorts of things? And then lastly, during the war, we might consider questions about hearts and minds. How do civilians decide who they're going to support? How do rebel groups respond to offers of community support? How are relationships between combatants and civilian groups forged and how do they mature. Then of course we might ask questions about the conclusion of the war. First and foremost we might ask questions about how long the war lasts, who wins the war, who gets favorable settlement terms, who gets bad settlement terms. We might also ask about cessation and peace. Who surrenders? Who monitors the post-conflict world? Um, where do former conflict elites or even soldiers end up in the peacetime order? Related to these questions, we might ask about reconstruction. Some communities remain violent after the war. Some places remain hotbeds for conflict after the war settlement. Other places rebuild more quickly. Why is it that some communities or some groups remain riven by violence while other communities that are affected by conflict recover relatively quickly? Okay, so moving on to our main question for today, Collier and Hoffler's Greed and Grievance in Civil War. We're going to go over another parallel paper toward the end of this hour uh, by Fearon and Leighton, which covers a very similar question. So a couple of the goals that we have for this class today. One, I'd like you to be able to understand and differentiate between the theories of how civil wars start at the macro level, why some countries experience civil war and others don't, what are the characteristics of those countries that make, uh, make war more likely to happen there, and what are the mechanisms that make that, uh, that give rise to that danger. Another thing that I'd like you to be ready to consider is how it is that Collier and Hoffler come to such a different conclusion than Fearon and Leighton. We're going to talk a little bit about the operationalization of variables here and what that can teach us about how we interpret social science papers. So we'll start off as we always do with the puzzle. It's a relatively simple one. We've already laid it out. Why do some countries experience civil war and others don't? 
put a different way, in a more scientific way perhaps, or in a way that emphasizes the influence of independent variables, what factors make a conflict more likely or a state's future more dangerous? And then in the context of the paper itself, what role does opportunity as opposed to motive play when determining if a war will occur? Lit review here is relatively simple. There wasn't a lot of writing on this before Pauli and Hoffler started up. Um, one school of thought sees that grievance, grievances within the population, which are feelings of hatred or disaffection toward powerful groups, might lead to conflict. So ask yourself, and we'll go through uh, some of this logic here in a few slides, but ask yourself what sorts of grievances might lead to civil war? And how might we operationalize those things in independent variables? So we might expect, for example, that there are ethnic groups that are in the minority, uh, religious groups that are in the minority that are repressed, and where those groups have enough willpower or they have enough political power, concentration of their population in certain areas, they might be tempted to rebel in order to address their grievances, in order to address their unequal treatment. Well, if we wanted to know whether a particular country included the characteristic of unequal treatment, whether there was a minority there that was being treated poorly, how would we go about measuring that? The second alternative explanation that was popular in the literature at the time this paper was written was greed, which is just that opportunity, uh, war is an opportunity for looting. So in this circumstance, we expect that the combatants begin the war because they're interested in capturing resources that they couldn't capture if the state remained in control. And so we attempt to create a zone of chaos where we can steal resources violently that we wouldn't be entitled to if the state remained in power. So um, these are both reasons that you might start a war. Either the war will be profitable or you think that it might change something that you find offensive about your social, social situation. But these are the benefits. These are the motivations for starting the war. And Collier and Hoffler argue that we've left something aside. What are we missing from the expected value calculation here? The theory is very, very simple. Essentially, civil war will happen more where the costs are low or the returns, the immediate returns to fighting are really high. This is the whole theory because people hadn't thought about it like this before, um, at least not since social scientists started using regression. So this will be one of the first papers we see that attempts to find empirical statistical evidence about why wars start. This is a regression paper, it's a big regression paper, which means that the interesting discussion is really all in how things are measured or defined and what they really mean, uh, or whether they really mean what the authors argue they mean. We talked about construct validity in the very first week of class, and now we're gonna take that concept head on. Okay, so what was the dependent variable again? How is that measured? Well, our dependent variable is civil war, and we have two elements, both of which are related to the number of casualties that are incurred during a conflict. Um, those two elements are enough total deaths to distinguish the conflict from a riot, and enough casualties on both sides to distinguish it from a massacre. So you don't want to count you know, the government going in and raising a particular neighborhood as an example of civil conflict because the people didn't really fight. So we need enough total casualties, and we need some amount of casualties to happen on both sides of the equation to demonstrate that there was actually a fight. Okay, so how do we predict whether or not this is going to happen? Let's take a look at a handful of our main independent variables. Let's say that a civil war is like a business. What's the challenge with starting a business? Why do people who think they have a great business idea sometimes not follow through? Well, there's massive startup costs. This creates risks, right? If we're thinking about a business, uh, you know, you might take out loans or sink your own personal money into uh, rent on a place that you run the business, raw materials for the product that you are about to manufacture, employees, these sorts of things. Um, so as a result of this common sense understanding that 
businesses have startup costs, Collier and Hoffler argue for two or three categories of things that seem to them to mitigate the startup cost. How, under what circumstances, do we think that it's easy to start a business when the business is war? Well, the first is that we have easy financing. Something out there underwrites our startup costs for relatively low interest, or maybe no interest. Maybe there's some reason that someone else wants the war to happen, so we get zero interest loan. Second, we might see that in the context in which we are operating, there are low opportunity costs. That is, there's no real alternative to starting the business or starting the war. And then lastly, there might just be low costs for the capital or supplies that we need. So if we live in a country where the uh, rent is very high, it might be daunting to start a business. You need a lot of money to rent out a space to run it. But if we live in a country where space is cheap, there's lots and lots of available um, space to run a business, you don't need as much startup capital in order to get going. Okay, so what might allow a rebel group to finance a war easily? What sorts of things might the rebel group use to finance a, a war? Well, there are three potential sources here. Um, extortion of natural resources, donations from diaspora, and subventions from hostile governments. Each of these is an independent variable that itself represents this idea of low startup costs. So now we need to measure each of these things somehow. So in order to measure whether it's possible that um, a rebel organization would exploit resources in order to pay the costs of their startup, we're going to take a look at a measure of primary commodities, that is, the ratio of primary commodities um, to the overall GDP of the state. So what we're measuring, the higher the ratio, the greater percentage of a country's GDP is created by primary commodity exports, Collier and Hoffler argue, the more likely it is that a rebel group could capture some place where the exports are coming from, the place where the primary commodities are mined, and then use their control over that place to raise money for the war by selling the primary goods that they own. So what types of things count as primary commodities? Well, there's a wide range of answers to this question, right? Iron ore, timber, diamonds, oil. Um, and this variety sort of gives rise to another question, which is how easy would it be for a rebel group to export these things, right? What's the difference in terms of how lootable these resources are? Can we steal them? Is there anything different for a rebel group with respect to mining iron ore out of you know, a hard rock deposit versus alluvial diamonds that are just sort of kind of laying on the ground? Hopefully one of the things you're thinking is that some of these mineral resources are relatively hard to extract. The extraction of things like oil or iron ore from the ground are already a capital intensive enterprise. And so we'd have to believe if these things were paying for the war, that somehow the rebel group could come up with a cheap way of extracting them. Okay, low opportunity costs. If high levels of resources coming in are one way to defray the cost, then another is low opportunity costs. What this means is that the alternative activity to fighting the war is not much better, or the cost benefit of working is low. So how might we go about measuring this? How do we measure income that is foregone when we fight a war? How can we tell if people are earning so little that they might fight for cheap? Collier and Hoffler come up with three ways that they might measure this concept. The first is per capita GDP. The second is the rate of uh, secondary schooling and enrollment for young men. And then the third is GDP growth. So how do each of these measures conceptualize opportunity costs differently and what are the benefits and drawbacks of each? Well, per capita GDP just refers to the amount of money
that a particular person, the average person in a particular economy, might expect to earn in the following year. And so Collier and Hoffler argue that lower levels of per capita GDP tend to demonstrate that people are poorer and they have relatively less to sacrifice if they decide to fight a war. Of course, this might be a little bit misleading. You might have a country that is extremely unequal and it has a relatively high per capita GDP even though the people in the country are uh, obscenely poor. With respect to rates of secondary school enrollment, we can see here whether we have a high-skilled or low-skilled workforce. So we have a low-skilled workforce we might expect that uh, those people know that their labor isn't worth that much and they're likely to fight as a result of having um, you know, only low-skilled offers available to them. GDP growth, if we think that the country is growing, becoming economically healthier, then we might think that our, our prospects in the future are good. And so if all of these things are relatively depressed, if the country is relatively poor, if secondary school enrollment is low and GDP growth is not moving fast, we might expect that people in these countries are pessimistic about how much money they're going to make in the coming years from taking on a normal job. And therefore, the cost to them, the, the foregone opportunity cost to them of fighting the war is relatively low. All right, then the final way that we might differentially pay for the startup costs of a conflict is if we just live in a world or a context in which the cost of starting up a war is low um, for some particular reason. So it's possible that some places have a lower cost of fighting than others. For example, weapons might be cheap. Weapons might be abundant and cheap, and therefore we don't need to raise as much money to have a credible uh, rebel army in these places than we would in, in contexts where weapons cost a lot. Rough terrain. We might expect that places that have rough terrain like mountains or forests or swamps are lower cost places to fight. You need less startup capital. Why would this make a war cheaper? What thing do insurgents have to do or create or pay for if the terrain isn't rough? Well, if the terrain isn't rough, the insurgents are going to have to come up with some base area that they can protect from the state. On the other hand, if you have highly mountainous regions, highly forested regions or swamp regions that are difficult for the state to get to, that are sparsely populated, we might expect that um, the rebels have to spend relatively less money protecting themselves because they can hide using a resource that's natural, that's already there. And then lastly, we might suspect that opportunity costs are lower where the population is dispersed. Why would rural areas be better to fight a conflict? Well, we suspect that, again, that these are the easier places to hide. We have tight-knit communities, which we'll talk about a lot more in the coming lectures, that, that are more willing to accept rebel soldiers. And we also have large swaths of unpopulated territory where no one can rat you out for being. Okay, so how are we going to measure or operationalize each of these concepts? Collier and Hoffler argue that they can measure the low cost of weapons by asking whether or not there had been a prior war. The logic being that where there had been a prior war, the weapons should be cheaper because the market will be flooded with the weapons from the last war. Now, there are at least a couple of problems with measuring the cost of weapons proxied by whether or not there had been a previous war. The more important of the problems, the most important of the problems, is that it seems to bake in a lot of the other variables into this measurement, right? If there was a prior war, not only are guns cheaper, but there was a prior war, that something about the country invited a civil war in the previous period. So whatever it was that um, whatever it was that created this prior war may still be functioning. And so what we're measuring with the prior war is not the low cost of weapons, but whatever it was that caused the prior war. So you're getting a little bit of tautological or circular reasoning here. 
The other potential problem with using prior war to proxy for the cost of weapons is that it's possible to go out and measure the actual cost of weapons. Uh, so just keep in mind that we might be thinking about measuring this directly. Collier and Hoffler don't. Rough terrain, we're going to measure by forest cover. Uh, we'll, we'll use forest cover as a proxy for rough terrain. There are alternative measures of this, like altitude, that might uh, work just as well. And dispersed population, we'll talk about the average population density. So now we can take a look at the opportunity variables we're going to measure in our regression and the mechanism of opportunity that they represent. Right? We're looking at a resource ratio, donations that we might get from diaspora, so whether or not there's a powerful diaspora, whether or not there's a powerful third country that would want to sponsor the rebellion. These opportunity cost variables that measure the extent to which people see that they have a positive financial future. And then capital costs, um, what things might raise or lower uh, the cost of starting a war. Okay. So now, of course, if we have variables that operationalize our um, that operationalize our theory, we need to be thinking about control variables that might stand in for the greed and grievance explanations, right? So the big alternatives here are the motive variables. Let's take a look at these things. Here's the way that we might proxy objective grievances. Um, we're going to look for signs of ethnic or religious hatred. We're going to look for signs of political repression, political exclusion, and economic inequality. So how will we go about measuring these things? Well, in order to tell whether there is religious or ethnic hatred, we're going to take a measure of the country's ethno-linguistic fractionalization. The way that the ELF measure works is this. It is the odds that if you pull two people out of a phone book or a list of the citizens in that community, that you will pull two people who are the same ethnicity or religion or race or whatever social characteristic it is that you're targeting. And so obviously the lower the likelihood that these people would be the same, the higher the measure of diversity. So notice that this ELF measure does not ask whether these ethnic or religious or linguistic groups are actually fighting. But Collier and Hoffler argue that you can't have ethnic conflict or religious repression if there's no diversity. And so they say that they don't actually need to measure whether or not the, uh, the ethnicities are in conflict. If there is a relationship between diversity and fighting, that must be because in some of those places where there is diversity, it's leading to fighting. So that's the logic behind the way we're going to measure this particular variable. Second, um, to measure whether or not we have political repression, we're going to look at the measures of civil rights from Polity 3. Polity 3 is a data set. Well, I guess now it's actually Polity 4. Polity 4 is a data set that gets refreshed every year. Experts on each country rate that country's institutions for their levels of democracy. And so from those institutions, we're going to pull out specifically the extent to which these countries have civil rights and assume that where those civil rights are low, we're seeing political repression. For political exclusion, we're going to look at ethnic domination. This is a different way of measuring ethnic diversity. We're just going to ask if there are substantial minority groups that are domineered as a function of percentage by larger groups. So for example, in a country that is 80% ethnicity A and 20% ethnicity B, we would say that ethnicity B is dominant. And finally, for economic inequality, we're going to look at the Gini coefficient. This is a, an economic formula that tells you how wealth is distributed in society. Um, as the Gini coefficient goes up with an upper bound of 1 and a lower bound of 0 as it goes up, society is becoming increasingly unequal. Okay, so the results are presented in two tables. The table shows results from, or this table shows results from the opportunity variables. Let's take a look um, in a little bit more detail here. Look for the stars, right? Let's take, a, let's take a look at where the stars are important. We see that primary commodity exports 
always very, very closely connected to war outcomes. Uh, the primary commodity squared, potentially even stronger, suggesting that there's some sort of curved relationship. It's not a straight line, it's a curved relationship between commodities and conflict. Male secondary schooling matters. The less well-educated a society is, uh, the more likely they are to see conflict. And the per capita GDP growth and the forecasts, or the per capita GDP and the forecast for growth are both also important in every model. The only other variable we see that's important in every model here is the log of the population, how, how large or small the country is. The next chart is going to show us the grievance model. Look at this poor grievance model. Only democracy registers as a consistent influence on conflict outcomes. The rest of the grievance variables are not associated with a higher risk for war. So Collier and Hoffler argue that the grievance model doesn't explain very much and that the opportunity model does. So here's a quick review. Here are all of the variables that we measured with grievance represented in red. The bolded variables were found to have a significant correlation with conflict. From this finding, Collier and Hoffler create some policy implications. They think that institutional change might solve the human problem. We might have less conflict if we get the institutions right. So what is the problem that causes civil wars in your view? Well, civil wars start when civilians have little better to do than fight for a bigger portion of a small pie. So how do we solve this problem? We increase the size of the pie. We get the government involved in better economic management. Collier and Hoffler argue that it's hard to explain the results they found with alternative theories. If it weren't the case that civilians are fighting for a bigger slice of a small pie, if it weren't the case that we could prevent civil wars by getting people jobs, by increasing diversity in the economy, then why did we see such strong relationships between primary commodity exports and underemployment and conflict. Well, Fearn and Leighton have an answer for that. Let's take a quick look at a paper that I didn't assign that tackles the same fundamental question. About 90% of the data that Fearn and Leighton use um, for these regressions comes from the same source as Collier and Hoffler. Collier and Hoffler offer three potential theories and or sorry, Fearn and Leighton offer three potential theories, and these should be somewhat familiar from Collier and Hoffler, so we can buzz through them relatively quickly. When we think about diversity as being a potential source for conflict, we look at demographic structure, and again, we're going to be thinking about ELF. What are the chances that two members drawn from a, a pool of society are of the same ethnicity or speak the same language or of the same religion? We might also ask how many languages are spoken in a country or the percentage of the population that exists in a majority group. Similarly, is there a significant minority? This is a binary variable. So these two things down here are really getting at the question of um, ethnic domination, whereas these up here are getting more at the number of, of different groups that exist. So here we can derive some hypotheses that higher ELF, greater diversity, leads to higher chances of war. The higher the number of languages, the higher chances of war. And both of these are the same kind of logic that we saw in Collier and Hoffler. The greater the diversity is, the greater the chance that two of these groups aren't going to get along. The higher the percentage of people in the majority group lowers the chance of war. Now, why would this happen? Well, of course, because if you have one group that totally dominates the conflict um, or totally dominates the country, the tiny minority group is unlikely to revolt. They, they recognize right off the bat that they're not going to win the conflict because they represent a tiny part of, of the population. We also have some grievance hypotheses. Here we see Polity 4, Freedom House and Chesworski, measures of democracy. 
So in the same way that Collier and Hoffler used polity three to measure whether or not there was democracy, whether or not people might be fighting for their rights, here we see those re-operationalized using three different measures of democracy. We also look to see whether there is an official policy of religious or language discrimination. This will help us get to the question of whether diversity causes conflict just because it's about um, dislike of one another, or whether that diversity needs some kind of a grievance, some, time, some kind of oppression in order to activate it and to turn it into something that's ugly. And then finally, with respect to grievance, we look at income inequality by again looking at the Gini coefficient that that measured. Our grievance hypotheses then, higher democracy scores should lead to lower chances of war. People should be happier if they live in more democratic states. Official religious or language discrimination should lead to a higher chance of war. Obviously, the, this suggests that there are some groups who would like to fight. Higher Gini coefficient leads to higher chances of war. Things are unequal, and so we want to make them equal by fighting. We think that we uh, could make things more equal. We could distribute wealth. We could get something. The poor could get something out of fighting this war. Opportunity variables. These things we've been through for the most part before. Um, we're talking about places to hide, like rough terrain. We've added to this rough terrain concept the, the concept of cross-border sanctuaries. Rough terrain is a helpful place to hide, but it might also be helpful if you have some local allied population that lives just across the border where the army can't chase you and you can go and hide those places. We're also going to look at GDP per capita as a way to measure local government capacity. So Collier, or Fearn and Leighton argue that confronting rebel groups, gathering the intelligence you need to confront rebel groups, um, having the material yourself to fight wars, requires that the country raises a lot of taxes. And Fearn and Leighton argue that taxes are easier to collect where you have a mature and diversified economy. And so they operationalize low government capacity as GDP per capita. They also look at measures of political instability, oil exports, and the population of the area. Here we can see these hypotheses summed up in the directions that we kind of expect or remember from Collier and Hoffler. Okay, so what do the results look like? Voila, per capita income strongly correlated with the Civil War. Mountainousness. Not so strongly correlated. It works in the first model, but not the second. Oil exports, relevant in both cases. Whether the state is new, whether the state is unstable. Here we have the majority of stars, right? Per capita income, log mountains. And I guess I should have it down here on oil export for the new state. So, Fearn and Leighton paint a portrait of a state that's out of touch with an important part of its constituency. The state doesn't collect much in taxes. They rely on natural resource rents, the extractive capacity. Local officials in rural areas with rough terrain operate independently of the central state. They don't really represent the central government. They're powers of their own. And this leads to low startup costs and tempting spoils for initiating conflict. So in order to prevent civil wars, we should strengthen the government with aid and with military training programs. So let's compare these two papers and what they found, right? Fearn and Leighton argue that civil wars start when poor citizens with little hope of economic participation recognize an opportunity for short-term profit. You know what? This is actually backwards. I can fix that right now. Collier and Hoffler find that civil wars start when poor citizens with little hope of economic participation see an opportunity for short-term benefit. That's different than what Fearn and Leighton find. Fearn and Leighton find that civil wars start when states that have Dutch disease or that rely over much on primary commodities um, create challenges for political control. Right? These are places where um, the state has a hard time resisting because they don't collect taxes. They don't know their own populations very well. The differences between these papers should be puzzling for a number of reasons. First, 
both of the papers are cited orders of magnitude more often than other papers in the civil conflict space. These are the two most important papers in the Why Do Wars Start Country Level Literature. The second, using our comparative framework, we can see that the data and methods and the training and tradition of the scholars who wrote these two papers are the same, and yet they come to very different conclusions. So what could possibly be the independent variable that drives this difference? In fact, when we look at the models, we see that they come to similar conclusions. Oil exportation matters to both models. Uh, low income per capita matters to both models. So that we're even seeing similar results in deriving opposite conclusions. Well, the problem, I think, comes from the fact that these two papers frame what their independent variables measure very differently. Let's take a look at the example of income per capita. For Collier and Hoffler, this operationalizes peacetime and incentives for civilians. How much money would you make if you were working? So what we have here is a measure of the way that civilians are trading off between their old jobs and what they might make if they fought in the war. Fearn and Layton operationalize GDP for a different purpose. They argue that having a low GDP per capita is a way to measure low operational capacity of the state. States with low income can't collect much in taxes and therefore can't afford much of an army. Both of these characterizations of per capita income and what it means for the competition between a government and a rebel group are plausible. Both of them are defensible, but they lead us to very different conclusions about why the war starts and what we could do to prevent conflict. Inequality is framed in a very different way, too, right? For Collier and Hoffler, inequality means a large pool of poor people that are available to fight and that maybe have a grievance against the upper class. For Fearn and Leighton, inequality is evidence of large groups of the population that aren't serviced by the state and therefore aren't well known to them. The state's not there providing welfare, the state's not there collecting taxes, so the state doesn't know what's going on. And these places provide low cost hiding spots. Okay, so discussion questions then about this lecture, just as we wrap it up. Oil has a very strong association with civil war. Is this conflict about resources or opportunities? How do you make the case that both of them um, might be what's going on here? And then second, low population density is significant. Oh, well, I guess these aren't really relevant to our discussion of civil conflict, so we can ignore the second discussion question and we can close out this lecture, and I will see you in the coming lectures on the principal agent problem and uh, community and individual mechanisms for war mobilization.